This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and long live the Droid line. It's still there. It's going on Verizon, and this is the latest model. This is the Droid Turbo, and you know, it is the best Droid yet. Thank goodness. We like to see products get better, but 5.2 inch high resolution display here. The latest Snapdragon 805 processor. Interesting visual options here for your casing design, and we're going to look at it now. So this is the Droid Turbo. Of course, being a Droid, it's exclusive to Verizon Wireless. And why do we have the screen off? Not because we think that it looks so cool this way, but because it has that neat thing just like the Moto X. There's a sensor up there, so it knows if you wave your hand over it, so you can get status quickly and easily, and then just swipe to unlock like any other Android phone. Love that feature. Love that feature on the Moto X. It's just real handy. You know, you don't have to actually wake up the phone, do all that stuff. Just see what's going on there. AMOLED display as, again, we saw that on the Moto X and Moto X second gen, but this time is up to 2560 by 1440 resolution on a 5.2 inch panel. That's 565 PPI. That is so way beyond even what the most eagle eyed of you can possibly see in terms of perceiving individual pixels that we won't even go there. Super high density display, obviously. And it's a droid, so the looks can be a little bit flashy, a little bit polarizing. Some of you have seen the ballistic nylon one. Obviously, this is the Kevlar red finish, which is actually more grippy. You can get this in Kevlar red and Kevlar black. It shows fingerprints a little bit. It's not really too bad, but you got some nice finish going here over the Kevlar, kind of frosts it out on the edges. It's not as ugly as I thought it would be, to put it simply. You know, when we first saw pictures of this, I thought, oh boy, it's going to be another one of those out there droids. But it's, it's actually pretty neat looking. And if you do like red, the red is well, pretty unique and pretty zingy. And it's very, very durable. I mean, I don't feel a need to put a case on this. I have accidentally dropped it on the desk a few times. No problems there. However, if you like the even more interesting, because Moto, boy, ever since they've been doing the Moto X with the customizable backs, they have some interesting finishes that they can play with. You don't get the neat bamboo wood or leather options like you do on the Moto X. In fact, you can't order any customized version of this. But besides the red and the black model, there is the ballistic nylon. And you guys know that from rugged backpacks, luggage, that sort of thing. Actually has a weave texture on the back. It's pretty cool looking. I do worry about crumbs maybe finding their way into the weave, but it seems fairly tight. And that one is available in 32 and 64 gig capacities. This here, 32 gig capacity. So for those of you who want higher capacity, you got the ballistic nylon option, black ballistic nylon, not any outlandish color there. Ballistic nylon weighs just a little, little bit more. This is six ounces. It's heftier than the average phone. There's a reason for that. I'll tell you what it is. Giant battery inside, 3,900 milliamps. Wow. So the ballistic nylon goes up to 6.2 ounces. Not a big difference. And it's just a hair, hundredths of an inch thicker as well. Anyway, not a bad looking phone at all. It's got a curve to it right here. It's, it's you know, it's got that distinctive Moto look, I have to say. It's it's certainly not angular like past droids. It's, it's not the Moto X look, but has their signature thing going on. And we have a little chin over here, which I actually like because how many times have I picked up particularly Samsung Galaxy phones and accidentally touched the buttons because there's really nothing going on below the capacitive area. So it's actually pretty easy to pick this up without actuating the buttons. Speaking of the buttons, there they are capacitive. Even though Google owned Motorola at the point that this was designed and manufactured and they really don't like the capacitive buttons, they want them to all be on screen. Well, it has them anyway. So those of you who are fans of those, well, they're there. Micro USB 2.0 port here on the bottom edge. Interesting thing here on this side, we have our controls right here. We have the, the power button. It's kind of a nice ridged metallic feeling thing. And we have our power toggles as well. Now your micro, your nano SIM rather, is underneath the volume controls. You need a fingernail and you're going to grab and you're going to yank this out. If you don't have fingernails, go find somebody who does. Not that you have to take out your SIM card that often. But that's where it is. No expandable storage here, just the built-in storage. So again, 32 gigs or 64 gigs is available. Our 32 gig model has about 23 gigs free. The 64 gig has a little over 52 gigs free. So pretty decent amount of storage. On the back, besides the little Motorola logo over here and our LED flash, we've got a 21 megapixel camera. This is a Sony sensor. 
But you know how Motorola is with cameras. They can manage to screw up most any camera sensor, no matter how good it is. The happy news here is it's certainly no worse than the second generation Moto X and a little bit better. Certainly you get bigger pictures with more pixels. It's really going to shoot, shoot a 15.5 if you opt for 16 by 9 widescreen mode, but it's not bad. Even in low light, you know, it's not the world's best camera I've ever seen, but it, it's, it's actually pretty usable. And in good light, it's quite good. A little bit sometimes cranky on the focus. I, I prefer to use the tap to focus and tell it where to focus because it has ideas of its own that sometimes aren't really, well, the best. And on front, we have a two megapixel camera for your selfies and what have you, video chat. It's a little slow, honestly. I don't mean slow with the shutter speed so much as I mean when it's updating what you see on screen here. The frame rates are a little slow. Hopefully it'll be a firmer update to speed that up a little bit. This here, one big long speaker. No stereo speakers here, single speaker. The earpiece, of course, also operates through here. And it's offset to the right, this part of the speaker that uses for the earpiece when you're on a call, which is a little bizarre. And that coupled with a little bit lower than average call volume, you know, if you're always in noisy locations, you probably want to use a headset with this instead. That's all I can say. So what's inside the phone? The quad-core Snapdragon 805. That's the latest, greatest. We also saw that in Samsung Galaxy Note 4. It's clocked at 2.7 gigahertz, Drino 420 graphics, and it needs a little extra graphics punch to drive that higher resolution display. Three gigs of RAM. So there you have it. Right now, that's as flagshipy as you get in terms of specs there. And it does benchmark very well on synthetic benchmark tests and, you know, about what you would expect, also similar to the Samsung Galaxy Note 4, 22,709 on Quadrant. On 3D Mark, it scored 20,735, pretty hearty score there. For Geekbench 3, the single core test, 1088, multi-core, 2960. So fast, yes it is. And what's even faster about this is the fact that this is, well, it's the whole Google influence on Motorola. It's running very clean Android here. It's Android 4.4 KitKat, but it should be one of the first phones to actually get an update to Android Lollipop, otherwise known as 5.0. So other than you got a, a nice little actually weather and clock widget right there that's customized and Verizon's little My Info Zone, which is kind of actually useful, it tells you about your storage, your signal, all that sort of thing. You've got clean Android going on here, and it is very fast, very responsive. So for those of you who looked at this Galaxy Note 4 to Galaxy S5, for example, and you said, nice phones can't take all that touch with business going on, or even the LG G3 with its big heaping of LG UI, very clean, very fast. One of the first to get Android upgrades. That's a good thing. In terms of your drop-down kind of thing, it's also very simple. Motorola is going to give you little hints about how to use Moto Assist and all the other features here. It can do things like cleverly say, hey, I'm in a meeting. Don't make any noise, for example. It can sense when you're driving and read text messages at, out loud to you and tell you who is calling, which will scare the heck out of you the first time, but after that, you probably will like it. So pretty simple settings right here. Again, vanilla Android-y. We go to the full settings. All the normal things. The only thing that's added in here is the Moto settings. And there's also a Moto app. You can do the same thing. And you've got the quick route to the Moto actions that you can do right here. And you probably noticed there's something for Droid Zap. Droid Zap is for wirelessly sharing things like photos with other Android phones. It does not have to be a Motorola phone. Phone has dual band Wi-Fi AC. Reception is not the strongest we've seen. We're not that far from the access point right now, so we got full bars right there, but it's not hideous. It's not like a problem child, I wouldn't say, but compared to some of the strongest phones out there, it's just okay for the Wi-Fi signal. Bluetooth 4.0, we have NFC. It works with ISIS mobile payments as well, and of course the usual GPS with GLONASS and 4G LTE. And one thing I can tell you about the reception on this is it does hold onto a signal. We're in a kind of fringe area here for Verizon LTE, and it has managed to not drop it, even when it goes down to a really sad 115 dB, higher numbers or worse, actually, in signal strength right here. It manages to hold on. It does not hold a signal, get as strong a signal as a Galaxy Note 4. That one was managing about 10 B strong 10 dB stronger signal in low signal areas. If you have pretty good, moderate to good reception in your area, none of that's going to matter. But for those of you who are in fringy areas, I have to say the Note 4 
is the monster of reception. This does do a little bit better than the Sony Xperia Z3V that we also have in house for reception. And overall, data transfer speeds have been similar over LTE despite the signal differences. You know, in a poor signal area, say we get 8 megabit per second down according to speedtest.net with this one, and we'll get 10 with the Galaxy Note 4. So, not a huge difference there. So 3,900 milliamp battery sealed inside in order to make it as small as possible. It's neither particularly skinny nor particularly light because it has that big battery in there. One neat thing and why it's called the Turbo is because it comes with a turbocharger. That's Qualcomm Quick Charge 2.0. So it, it depends on how big the battery capacity is to how fast you can charge on a given phone. Given how big the battery is here, if you plug it in for half an hour, you should get 25% of your charge back on the phone. That's pretty darn fast compared to other phones. You might even do a little bit better there. Qualcomm makes some pretty bold statements there, but that's usually for phones that have something like a 26 to 2800 milliamp battery where they're saying you go up to 50% in a half an hour. You won't go that far in this, but still very fast. Should you prefer wireless charging, this is wireless charging enabled. You don't have to buy any other back. You can't buy any, really, except for you know, if there was an external clip on, because this doesn't come off this back. Anyway, wireless charging with Qi right here. Now, Qi won't be as fast charging, obviously, as the turbo charger will. You can also use a regular charger with this. If you have a, another smartphone charger sitting around, it just will charge at more normal speeds instead. So besides the durability here, on the front we have Gorilla Glass 3 as well. And they're pretty sure of themselves as you get one free screen replacement should you manage to shatter the display in the first year. So that's a nice little vote of confidence. In terms of display, this is a little bit brighter than the Moto X second gen. We weren't thrilled about the brightness level on the Moto X second gen. It wasn't hideous, but it wasn't fantastic. This one gets a bit brighter. Not as bright as the Galaxy Note 4, which is pretty eye-searing, even if it doesn't click into outdoor mode, but I find it more than bright enough. In fact, right now we're running an auto brightness, something that I would almost never do. It's kind of a dim day, so we don't want to blow out the scene either with a too bright display. Now let's just switch that over so we can see what it looks like if we take it off auto and put it up really high. So it gets fairly zingy. I mean, it's a fairly dark theme there. It's hard to tell, but bright enough. Color is it's your typical AMOLED. You're going to get near infinite contrast, very deep blacks, and zingy colors. I do like what Moto does. Some people think it looks kind of beige or yellow, but honestly, AMOLED displays, even LCDs, are often really tuned too cool in terms of color bias. This one is actually a bit more accurate in terms of color calibration, and that bit of warmth makes actually, you know, humans look better if you're watching movies and things like that, but really nice, really colorful display. So for those of you who are thinking about the LG G3 but you thought the IPS LCD looked a little washed out, you won't feel that way about this one. And this is just a little bit smaller than the LG G3. And for a size comparison sake, so you can see here is the Galaxy Note 4 Verizon Edition, though all carrier editions really are physically identical. Certainly a very big difference in size there and what's going to fit in your pocket, 5.2 inches versus 5.7 inch display. And we have the LG G3, which is going to be a close competitor because it too has that curved back that feels good in your hand, 5.5 inches. Not too, too much bigger, but it is still bigger. And you can see which one has the zingier display. That would be our droid here. Lastly, the classy glass Sony Xperia Z3V here in bright white. And it has a, a big area, top and bottom, in terms of bezels, so it ends up being a bit bigger, certainly. And this one has the glass, which looks very lovely. Of course, it doesn't have the same durability. I wouldn't drop this on the desk and go, whoops, who cares? It's glass. You've got to be a little bit more careful. This guy is for you durable types. In terms of screen size, I think 5.2 inches is a nice sweet spot between pocketability and actually having readable desktop sites like our own site right here. Of course, you can zoom in if you need to, but... Pretty good, and you know, the white is a fairly neutral white there too, which is a nice thing. Not too blue, not dingy yellow, looking good. Now let's test out video playback to see how it does. This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and sometimes we see things again, and they get a little bit bigger, sometimes a little bit better. That's mostly the case with the Lenovo ThinkPad Yoga 14, as you might guess. It's the 14-inch version of the Yoga. 
Looks good, looks sharp, lovely screen, great for watching videos. And you can hear the speaker, it's decent, you know, single mono speaker up there. If we crank it up to maximum volume as opposed to what you saw, which is somewhere between two thirds and three quarters volume, it can get pretty darn loud, but I think mostly headphones are going to be it for those of you who really want to listen to movies and enjoy them or listen to music. And now we're in Google Play Books, so you can see what text looks like. Given the extremely high resolution pixel density of the display, you expect it to look good, and in fact, it does with none of that kind of sickly amylid color tinge, but really, really sharp looking here. You don't have to worry about the sub-pixel matrix. When you're up to this pixel density, you're just not going to see anything on the edges here for our exciting Android lollipop manual, which is what we're looking at right here, right now. So one of our next reviews is going to be the Nexus 9 running lollipop. So also very good for reading. Let's see how it does for games. All right, we're in Asphalt 8 here. Very demanding racing game, and the frame rates are excellent on this, and the gameplay is also very smooth. Hey, that guy just snuck by me. Whoa. Very nice, very playable. Not seeing any stuttering here. So Asphalt 8 is looking good on this. If you you know you can't find much more horsepower than this right now. So if you're looking for something that has the oomph for the most difficult games, well, this and the Note 4 are two of the top performers at the moment on the market in the U.S. And here's another neat little parlor trick that's more than just that. That's one thing I like about Motorola. They put features on here that are actually useful. Just like the Moto X second edition that we reviewed, this one can always be listening for you. You teach it. The phrase that you're going to use to talk to it, you use it, and you can actually use your basically your Google Now commands without having to first wake up the phone. Yo, Droid Turbo, what's the temperature outside? It's 57 degrees in Plano right now. Magical, ain't it? So all in all, the Droid Turbo is an easy phone to recommend if you're on Verizon Wireless. If you're not in Verizon Wireless, but you're in South America, this will be available as the Moto Max. I'm sure importers will, will bring that to our shores as well. But if, if you like the Moto X, but you want an even higher end specs, what well, you got here, the higher resolution display, significantly higher resolution display, the faster Snapdragon 805 CPU in here, the really humongous battery inside. Now, Verizon claims up to two days use on a charge, and that's a bit optimistic, to be honest, because we're powering that really high-resolution display, fast CPU in here, but with, with moderate to heavy use, really, it still goes a day and a half, and that's pretty darn impressive, where other phones would definitely stop by bedtime, if not sooner, so you're getting that as well, and you got a couple of choices, too. You can go crazy zingy red, you can go less zingy black, or you can get the ballistic nylon, which I think a lot of people find attractive, though no more grippy than this. Actually, this is a little bit more grippy. But overall, a really solid phone, nice, clean Android interface. It's going to be getting updates really quickly to Android Lollipop and hopefully be on, too, thanks to the close relationship that they have with Google. So there it is. So that's the Droid Turbo. It's available now. The usual price, $199 with two-year contract or $599 without contract. And then $50 more if you want the 64 gig. Your choice of classy Kevlar red, classy Kevlar black, or a ballistic nylon for something new and tactile. No matter which way you go, this is one of the strongest Android phones currently on the market. And too bad it won't be on AT&T or T-Mobile or Sprint. But you know how it goes. The droids are always the exclusive one. Lots of good features in here. Can't blame me if you buy it. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.